five scores. Rick Bud. We decided to get ourselves back in the game again with our podcast. Rick Bud. Probably the craziest story that you're ever going to hear about hockey. We're going to be coming back to you on a regular basis. You are listening to Squid and the Ultimate Leafs fan. Hello Canada and hockey fans of the United States and Newfoundland. And an extra big hello to Canadian servicemen overseas. Welcome everyone to episode 107 of the Squid and Ultimate Leafs fan show. I'm Mike Wilson, the Ultimate Leafs fan. Joining me as always, my winger, Ricky Squid Five. How are we doing there, my man? I'm good. I'm good, Mike. Uh, I'm recovering from the five games I played last Friday and uh, starting to feel a little better now. That's good to hear. I played three on Saturday, but, you know, anyway, you know, <laughs> guess who's in the better shape? I was feeling good. But mind you, I played Sunday night and it was brutal. So, you know, maybe <laughs> not. Maybe not. Maybe it was all of my dreams there, Rick. Maybe it was all of my dreams. Well, uh... We have a special show today, or we think it's a special show today. In honor of the heartbreaking news we all experienced in the last week or so with Boris Salming, the Leaf legend who suddenly passed uh, with that terrible disease, ALS. ALS. Um, a long t- longtime teammate and very good friend of yours. We thought what we're going to do is we, we had a great interview with Boya a little over almost two years ago, but we want to replay that. You want to hear it during the good times. He goes through his whole career, a lot of his career, not the whole career, but a lot of the career. Uh, it was a two-parter, tons of information, told us tons of stories. And just before we set that up, I thought we'd get a little bit of your thoughts, Squid, on you know playing with the man for so long, getting to know him. But let's just go down memory night a little bit here and says, talk about, like as an example, talk about the first time you met Boy when he arrived from Vancouver. Well, um, I mean, I got planked right in between uh, Boria and Ronnie Ellis uh, when I got there <laughs> and Boria had the, he was on, on the end of the bench and, I, and then me and then and Ronnie. And it was kind of like, uh, I don't know. It just felt to me like it was that, like a cartoon where you got the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other pulling you and see which way you go. Um, so I kind of went more to Boria's side and, uh, you know, but we became good, good friends and, and good teammates. Uh, you know, they, he was always there to help me. And, uh, you know, especially when I was named captain at 22 years old and we had an older team and, you know, he was the first guy to step up whenever I said anything. And if anybody, you know, was goofing around or anything and, and, you know, tell them to shut up and pay attention and, you know, so that that was, uh, uh, you know, but we were we were good friends even before that, and because uh, Boria was just a, a fabulous individual, person, like he was just a great person. He got along with everybody. I don't think there was a guy in the team that he didn't get along with. Yeah, that's not surprising, but that yeah. doesn't surprise me. Well, where I was going, like you, know, you obviously knew about him, but arriving from Vancouver, along with Billy Gallego. Let's just talk about this. How long before you realized now Daryl Settler was obviously a very strong leader in the room, but how long yeah. before you realized that 21 had a pretty big voice in the room as well? Uh, well, I, I found out right away. Um, you know, Daryl wore the C, but I, I can tell you right now, they were pretty equal in, in you know, who was uh, in the room, you know, who, who was, who were the leaders and, and they were, you know, Daryl was obviously the captain and what he said obviously was going to go, but you know, Boria was, he was big. I mean, um, I, I would put him pretty darn close to Daryl in, in one of the leaders on that team. Yeah. That's not surprising. So just the, as a man, almost just take the hockey aside from it. What will you remember the most about Boria? I think probably, <laughs> Uh, probably his kindness. He, he, Boria was just a real likable guy that loved all the guys and, you know, never treated anybody differently, treated everybody the same. Um, he was just a wonderful person. I mean, uh, aside from being a, an unbelievable hockey player, he was, he was just a wonderful person. He, he had a, had a family. He was, you know, I mean, there's there's not much more I can say other than that 
he was wonderful to everybody on the team and all, and all the fans and everybody. He, that's just the way Borea was. Well, it's funny you say that because during the Leaf unveilings, I was very fortunate to be invited to mo- all of those. And after one of the unveilings, I was standing and he came walking up to me and I'd met him before a couple of times. He walked up and goes, Mike, when am I getting the invitation to see the room? But he just said it like we've been friends for 25 years and we just were, were a casual acquaintance. You know, he may have recognized who I was and, and nodded at me. He may not even remember my name, but here he came up, knew my name and he's asking, when can I come and see the room? But it was just just like one of your buddies would do. And yeah. I said, well, I made a joke. I said, do I have to supply the beer too? And, you know, he started laughing and made a joke. And we came over and we had a wonderful chat. But mm-hmm. you could just see I was nobody special. And I'm telling you, he just, it was just so natural. And the way he just was acting, you just thought, man, what a guy this guy is. Yeah, I mean, he would he would help guys too in the room. You know, the, the younger guys and their came in at 18 years old. He was always there talking to them and trying to, you know, help them get through what they were going through. And I mean, cause you can imagine some of these guys were not prepared or ready to play in the national hockey league at 18 years old. And, but they were there and they were going to play regardless. And three of them were defensemen. Yeah. So Boria was always trying to help these guys. And, you know, he, he went out of his way, uh, pretty much, you know, on a regular basis to help guys on the team uh, day in and day out. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, he would have parties at his place, you know, probably once every month, roughly have everybody come over. And uh, there was beer, there was everything, food, you name it. And he never asked anybody for a dollar. So he was, again, that makes him one of the leaders of the team when he gets everybody together in one house and their, their families, their wives and everything. And uh, so that's the type of guy Boria was. Now, didn't you get a surprise one at one of those parties and you get yourself a drink out of the fridge one time? <laughs> I did. I uh, went in the kitchen. There was two of those sub-zero fridges, which are very large. So I opened one looking for a beer, nothing there. I didn't realize there was coolers and everything out in the backyard and all that. But uh, then I opened the other one and the entire fridge was vodka. (laughs) I mean, I'm not kidding. Like, I mean, from bottom to very top, it was just all bottles of vodka. And I, I don't know if I had to guess, I would say there was probably 150 to 200 bottles of vodka in that fridge. (laughs) I thought, what the heck is this? (laughs) <laughs> um, and I asked Borja and he goes well in Sweden he said we we like our vodka cold and we like to drink it in shots and a, a little bit of an accent he had not much but a little bit and uh, I said oh okay I understand now but I don't know why you need 200 bottles but <laughs> I mean whatever <laughs> well he was a popular guy squid so I'm sure he was doing lots of toasts and lots of uh, which oh speak- yeah well, which brings me to the next thing is it was no secret. He loved to have a good time, but it's one thing to enjoy life, but another when it comes to playing in at an elite level as well. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible, you know, what a, a specimen he was of an athlete. Uh, Cause when you think of a guy who goes up North skiing with his family on a Saturday afternoon for several hours and come back down and play a game that night and be one of the best players on the ice. That is staggering to think about that, you know, uh, or being out till five or six o'clock in the morning and playing the next night and still, and getting first star and getting a goal and two assists. That was Boria. He loved life, but when it came to the game, he was invested in it 100% and he could go out and do those things and still be the best player on the ice, which kind of drove a lot of people crazy on the team because, you know, they, they couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So I didn't even bother trying. (laughs) Well, one of his roommates told a story of that. He was out with an ally. Freddie believe tells the story that he was out with them one night. I think it was in Vancouver. You probably know this story and they were out quite late. 
and they got home with a couple hours to spare before they had to head, head back to the rink. They did mm -hmm. very rough and very grudgingly get through the workout. And boy, goes, no, come on, we're going skiing. And went skiing for the day and played that yeah. night and was first star. Yeah, I remember and that. Meanwhile, here's the youngster. He couldn't even barely keep his head up after practice. He said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and this well, guy did it. I don't believe I don't know if Al went skiing or not. But, but he was there. I guess he, Borya went and did it. And then Borya came back and was, and you know, the, the kid went back to their hotel and went to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Borya, they were out uh, quite late and uh, got through the pregame skate. And then Borya went skiing. I think Al might have went up the mountain with him, but I don't think he skied. Yeah. And then right back to the hotel and, and had a long nap, whereas Borya didn't. And, uh, and then he went out and didn't look like he never did anything. Like he was just, you know, worked out the day before and st and got to bed at 10 o'clock at night, whereas Al was was struggling to get through that game. Well, of course, you know, hockey is all about bonding and bonding is over beers and teams that, you know, teams that drink together, play well together and all that. That was back yeah. in the era, our age, our, our genre growing up. And But when you went out with the first time, what were your expectations? Because here's this European guy. Now, you maybe had heard some stories about him, but did you expect him to be a low-key guy, quiet, or, you know, especially since you had some real characters on that team? Well, Borea was kind of low-key. I mean, you know, like, we'd go to the bar, and, you know, you wouldn't really hear him a whole lot or anything. He, You knew he was there, obviously. Yeah. Um, But he, he wasn't one of those guys that, that got loud and – and crazy and everything. He, he was pretty calm and um, sitting at the bar and whatever. And there was other guys that would get loud and crazy and, and stupid. Whereas Boria wasn't like that. Boria was uh, always pretty calm. You know, he, he did drink uh, like the rest of us, but, uh, but he never got crazy. And, but, uh, and maybe that was part of, why he was one of the leaders because he was one of the guys that could probably drink a lot more than most guys <laughs> and not get crazy. And so, you know, he was kind of looked upon as one of the leaders because he was a guy that was always calm in the bar and not making a fool of himself or anything when, you know, myself and other guys were. And uh, so. Well, you know, this as well as I do, there was a point in that era where, the European players were criticized for not socializing with the players and going out. And it, I heard this from a number of guys throughout the league that they would beg these guys, just come for one beer, sip on mm -hmm. ginger ale after that. They won't even know you're not drinking liquor, but just come for a beer, show your parlor. But I know Boria told us, and you'll hear it on the podcast, he tried to get Inga to be a part of it. Just come for one beer, show your part of it, because it's a big thing in North America. And Boria got that and grasped that right away. That's where I was going with it. This just yeah. doesn't come to you naturally. This is a guy who gets it. And this, you know, he's not an old guy. And he got how it worked coming to a strange country and fitting in like he did. It just speaks more volumes to how great he really was. Absolutely. And and how smart he was because he figured it out pretty quickly. And he he went out like, I mean, you didn't have to grab Boria by the arm and drag him out. Let's put it no, that way. But and you're right. There was a time when like, well, I'll tell you another one, and it doesn't involve Boria, but but he was there at the time, and that was when in a check, Freacher, and mm -hmm. a couple other checks came over, and we were chartering all the time, so we hardly stayed overnight. And Harold with the chocolate bars, when he grabbed the chocolate bars out of the wicker basket that the flight attendant had, and she wouldn't let him slap his hand, wouldn't let him have it, he canceled the charters for the second half of the season. Well, now we're staying overnight because we're flying commercial. So now we're going out with Peter in a check and Freecher and all these guys. We got to know one another better. We got to trust one another more. And we were the, the fifth best team in the league in the second half of the season. And mainly because we started going out together, you know, and, yeah. and getting to know one another. Uh, I think Boria was ahead of the curve. I think he figured that out pretty quickly when he came over here, but he couldn't get Ingy to, go out and do it with them. And uh, that's probably why he didn't last very long. Now, let me ask you this, a, a couple of things here. First, his, what was he like in the room as, as one of the lads and his mood? Was he, 
you know, quiet and loose, say in practice, guys, obviously a little different at practice versus the game, but was there a big swing in his mood practice versus game and just his overall sort of way he was? Never, never. Mike, like, I mean, and I'm not kidding. I mean, nope. he was the exact same all the time. He was calm, cool, collected. He didn't lose his shit at all. He didn't, you know, get revved up or anything. And then he'd go out and all of a sudden he just hit a switch and he'd be the best player on the ice. And sometimes you just wonder, like, oh, he seems like he's pretty quiet. Like, I don't know how he's going to play. In it. And then he'd go on the ice and he'd be the best player out there. And uh, it was hard to fathom that he could be that calm. And then once he got on the ice – you know, because I kind of had to prepare myself and get ready and kind of, you know, get the juices going and everything and get ready for the game. And and uh, whereas he just sat there, cool as a cucumber, just went out and then did his thing. And so, yeah. it was a wonderful thing to watch. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's the whole point, you know, just yeah. being able to maintain that same sphere, whether it's a practice or a game, and be able to bring it and have that switch. I mean, that just, again – speaks to he was on another level now later on in my career or my time in toronto probably the last i want to say the last probably two years that i played in, in toronto borea never uh practiced the day after a game so he kind of got lucky that they that well it was probably harold that sent the message down to the trainers that i don't want him practicing the day after a game and 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 a lot of times he didn't take the pregame skate too, the last couple of years that I that I played there, and you know that's fine. I didn't. No, none of us had a problem with it because we knew he was going to be there come game time. Yeah. So we, so it didn't really bother anybody. And it was like you know, and he was at that point he was by far the oldest guy on the team, and uh, you know by you know probably eight or nine years. So nobody really had a problem with it. So let me ask you this. Was he a prankster or a jokester? No, no, he wasn't. He, uh, I mean, he was, yeah, he liked to joke around and have fun, but yeah. he was not one of those guys that would prank guys or anything like that. He just, because he didn't like to get pranked himself. Okay. <laughs> Did anybody ever get him? No, I not, not when I was there. Anyway, they might've got him in the seventies. I'm yeah. assuming they probably did with the guys that he played with in the seventies, more than likely he got pranked several times when he first came over. I, I, that, that's my guess anyway, yeah. especially when you look at the guys he played with, cause there was a lot of pranksters in that lineup. <laughs> now over the past number of years, the room of Leafs has been a polarizing subject. How was it during the Salming Sitter era with you when you were there? I mean, it was okay. It was, uh, I mean, we had a turnstile of coaches that came came and left and <laughs> came and went and came and went. I mean, I had seven coaches in seven years. Um, so everything was changing all the time. But, um, yeah, I think the one thing, the one thing that never changed was the guys getting together and sticking up for one another. Uh, whether it be on the ice, whether it be off the ice. And that's one of the things that I, that never changed the, the whole time I, I played in Toronto. And uh, that, that was one of the things I loved about it was that the guys were all, you know, they were all together. Now that's not to say that there wasn't arguments amongst the guys yeah. and it actually, and fights in practice sometimes, you know, that happened. It, it did, but that would have been something crazy like maybe somebody pranked someone and they weren't happy about it and then they'd fight him in practice and then that was it it was over and we'd go back to being a team again and so I, that, that was one of the things i loved was that everybody was together now as daryl's problems with manage, management festered publicly how were the players dealing with it and how much of a calming influence here we go with boria it was boria once again he's a team guy but also close with daryl but it must have been hard at him. But again, how were the players looking to him for leadership when this stuff was going on with their own management? Well, I think 
The biggest thing was no one really talked about it that much. Um, you know, everybody knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, we knew that Daryl was going through a tough time with punch and lack and all that. I mean, everybody knew exactly what was going on, but it wasn't something that was discussed very often or talked about amongst the guys. And, uh, you know, and Daryl was, Daryl was very, very professional throughout that entire uh, time too. I mean, uh, you know, he, he didn't say anything about it. He didn't want to uh, talk to anybody about it. And, uh, and he didn't, you know, he was pretty, he was pretty, uh, <laughs> my phone, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's just, it's just one of my boys, my, one of my sons. <laughs> That's okay. It's only our podcast. That's okay. Folks like go right ahead. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that was the thing. Daryl was very professional throughout it all. He didn't let that affect what was going on in the dressing room or on the ice. And, and so we didn't really have to worry about it that much because he, he didn't bring it up. He didn't show it. Uh, you know, I, my memories are that he was very, very professional. He went out, did the best he could in the games, in practice, and didn't talk about it, didn't involve anybody. And I thought that was perfect the way he handled it. Now, you may have touched on already, but, but something about Boria that surprised you when you finally, when you finally got to play with him, not only, and it doesn't even have to be pertaining to playing on the ice, maybe just away from the rink. I, and I think your his calming influence, just how cool he was, always was was probably one of the things. Yeah, I think <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Mike. The thing that astonished me the most was how yeah. much he could party, or <laughs> how much he could go skiing the day of a game. Yeah. And still be the damn player that he was. I mean, it just baffled me, you know, because like I'm sitting here and I'm trying to get through all this and I'm I'm working my tail off. I can't even imagine going out that late and getting getting out there and playing the next night. Yeah. So that just I that marveled me really when you think about it. Like how he could do that and still compete at that level and be one of the best players on the ice every night. Well, his feats of strength are spoken of in godlike fashion. Any come to mind with you that you witnessed? No, it, he used to piss me off in practice sometimes because, you know, you, you're going around them and you think you're by them and you, you think you got, you're going to get a shot on goal and he would just put his stick in between your stick and your body and just give a little flick of the wrist. And your your stick would go, your hands would go like this, and the puck would go into the corner. And you would never get that shot. And, I, I, you know, and then you, you'd turn him and go like, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't really see what he did, right? And you just knew that, oh, I, okay, I'm going to get a shot. And the next thing you know, the puck's in the corner. So... You know, well, but that used to frustrate the hell out of me. And and then, you know, but then you'd see him do it in a game and it was legal back then. It was kind of like a can opener, but not yeah. really. It was like the between the stick and the body. I don't know if you could get away with that. today. Yeah, you, you might be able to because it wasn't anything big that you would see. It was just a little stick between the. No, you probably wouldn't get a penalty today. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get away with that today, but he did. No, I don't think so. Thank goodness he was wearing the right colors when he was doing it, that's for sure, and was sitting on the bench next to you. So I think I think we've got a pretty good introduction what to look for. We're going to turn it over now to Boy. This is the replay of the interview from a couple of years ago. That's a two-parter. So enjoy the first part, folks. And if you want to send us any thoughts uh, before next week, we'll be, we'll be coming to you with that. And, uh, again, enjoy this, and we'll talk to you again. It's time to bring our guest on. So without further ado, one of the first Europeans to play in the National Hockey League, made an immediate impact with the Maple Leafs, becoming a premier defenseman of his era, inducted in the Hall of Fame in 96, 1996 that is, named one of the greatest 100 players of all time in the NHL, and of course, an elite Maple Leaf, one of the best of all time, known as the King. We welcome Boria Salming. Boria, thanks for joining us today, and how are you coping these days with everything going on? Well, thanks. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good, you know. I'm getting old, you know, 69 years old, turning 70 next year. So I'm getting there, <laughs> but I'm fine. Really, I'm feeling good. 
Well, catching up to you. Uh, yeah, got one of your old buddies here with me, uh, Squid, on the other side of the... Yeah. Wow, that's nice to hear that. I, I talked to him for a week ago, too. So, uh, and I always see, you know, see him when we get over to the Hall of Fame uh, weekend and all that. But now we haven't seen each other for such a long time because, uh, you know, the, the barriers. Yeah, so... So speaking of which, with the virus, it's uh, put a little bit of crimp and everything going on. What do you think of the NHL playoff format? Well, I, mean, uh, I think it's pretty good. I mean, uh, of course, you know, you want to have the people up, you know, watching the games for, for the players. Uh, but I watch, actually watched the, the second game, and then they really, really played good. You know, so I saw that. Mm -hmm. It was an early game. So, so hopefully they're playing. Uh, I think they're playing tonight, aren't they? Yeah, they play tonight and uh, play tomorrow. So I think, yeah. Um, yeah, if they play like they did the end, they had a good shot. So you still follow oh, with yeah. great interest, obviously, the Maple Leafs. Mm -hmm. No, I, it, it is. You know, I, well, I think, uh, I, I mean, it's really hard, like, you know, to see. But, but for, for example, we can watch it on TV. So that's that's no problem to watch a hockey. They're sort of uh, watching TV in the regular time. So, but I guess it's hard for the players to play it with, without no, no people on the stand. So that's the only thing, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, uh, so we're going to watch with great interest, though. So uh, Squid and I have been talking a lot about it on our podcast. But huh. now for, I'm 66 this year, too. So I'm catching up to you, Boria. But, um, <laughs> and you know, Rick's a couple years behind us. But for the young listeners, <laughs> I would like to go back in your career. And starting back in Sweden, you played Division Two for a few years. And yeah. you were 16, I think, when you started playing there. And then you start, you graduated to the elite level for three years. Just talk about those years playing in in those leagues. Well, I mean, I, I come from the north part of Sweden. You know, Kiruna is really, really far up there. And then I moved down to uh, to uh, it's called Elite League today, which is the top league. And I played with, with Brunas, uh, which is sort of the top team there, and won the championship for uh, two years. And uh, on the same time, I, I sort of uh, qualified for the for the national team too. So I played two world tournaments in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia in Prague and also in Moscow in '73. Just before, just after that, I I, I joined the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. Now let's 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 walk through that. I mean, growing up as a young guy in northern part of Sweden, I played in Gotland, by the way, for a year. Oh uh, really? Uh, yes. <laughs> wow. Um, so I know all about Division Two. Then, now, did you ever dream of uh, possibly playing in the NHL, or did, were you just happy to play elite hockey and represent your country at World Championships? Yeah, well, I, mean, I was going to say in Kiruna, we almost didn't have a TV, so like you, you didn't know too much about uh, like National Hockey League, really. And I never had a dream of National Hockey League. All I, you know, my dream was, you know, I, I was growing up with my older brother. brother who sort of, uh, you know, was uh, above me the whole time. So I followed him all the way. And also in Brinas, you know, he went down there for two years before me. And then when he came, I came down there, I played uh, with him as a partner too. So I was following him. So he was my idol, sort of, uh, you know, that's, that's what it was until I went over to Canada. Well, let's walk through that. Jerry McNamara. Yeah. Now, Jerry McInerney did an event at my house tonight, and we talked this whole story about his career. So this yeah. is one of the highlights, obviously, is when he found you. But when he went to Sweden, he yeah. didn't go to look at you the first time, did he? No, no. He was looking, actually, you know, now afterwards, actually, I, I, he was looking for a, a goaltender, you know, in, in uh, Stockholm. And that's what it was. He was there and looked at him. And then all of a sudden, I, I think the you know the Canadian team came over for a tournament, which were was in my uh, my town, and mm -hmm. he, then he uh, I guess he met those guys, and uh, they said at least follow follow us. But I think he knew about Inga Hammerstrom. Yes. Yeah. So he knew about Inga, so he wasn't really in, interested in him. So that's why he went there. Now he tells the story that after watching you play, now this yeah. is Jerry's version. He actually yeah, went Jerry's ver Jerry's version might be different than everybody else's. But anyway, well, you can talk <laughs> in here at any time there, Squid. We'll give you a second here. But Jerry's version, and keep this in mind, boys, I'm giving his 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 take on this was that boy, he was looking for you after one of your games. He yeah. popped his head into a couple of the dressing rooms and he found you and he yeah. looked at you and you said, You play for the Maple Leafs? And you said yes. And he yeah. said, I'll come back to you. And that's kind of how it all started. Is that yeah. What you remember? 
Yeah, well, you know, when he came down to the dressing room, he, he actually, I got a, you know, when we played against the Canadian team, I got a game misconduct in the third period. So he, when I got game misconduct, I went into the, the dressing room. So all of a sudden, when I was sitting there by myself, I think it was just a trainer, uh, he came in. All of a sudden, it was a, a, a you know, big guy coming in and talking English. I mean, I didn't speak so much English at that time. So, <laughs> and but you know, he he said he you know well, what's wrong from Canada, and he just asked me right away, "Do you want to play uh, hockey in Canada, in Toronto Maple Leafs?" Uh, when I understood like Canada and Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, because I heard it, you know, like, so I said yes, and then he said he gave me his uh, card and said. Uh, Here's my card. I get in touch with you. Okay, I said. <laughs> I said I guess. <laughs> well, you know, as the story continues from there, apparently, and this is a lot of people may not know this, but back in Toronto, Bob Davidson was the head scout of the Maple Leafs, and uh -huh. Jerry worked for him. So now they had a very, let's put it this way, bombastic owner in Mr. Harold Ballard. So. Uh, you know, when Jerry went back and was given the scouting reports on you and a couple other players, yeah. Bob, I think, as Jerry puts it, nose was a little bit out of joint because he wanted to report to Harold. He didn't want to look bad. So he said he would come and look at you guys play. So when yeah. they came back to Sweden to watch you, yeah. you said to Jerry, according to Jerry's story, is that I've got a couple other guys you might be interested in. One guy's name was Anders Hedberg, and the other guy was Alf Nielsen. Uh -huh. Now, Jerry did say he really liked Anders, but he wasn't sold on Ulf because Ulf wasn't as good a skater as you and uh, Anders and, and uh, Inga. Uh, but he did say that you guys had a meeting with Bob Davidson, and Bob Davidson was pretty aggressive with Anders and kind of shook him up a little bit, and he didn't come. Is that, do you recall uh, that happened? I, I can't remember, like, you know, maybe they did, did have a meeting with, with Anders, but I remember we had a meeting uh, one day, an off day there, we went up to their hotel room, me and Inga, and talked to Jerry and Bob. So I, I remember that. And they said, they, you know, uh, there was sort of a half, after half of the tournament. So uh, they said they wanted us to come over to uh, Canada and visit and uh, see, uh, you know, uh, the gardens and all that stuff. So and we said, that, yes. Now, the other two guys, uh, the, the, the Hedberg and Nielsen, they did okay, I think, when they went to the WHA and not played for them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I know. I, you know because I, I, I can't remember I, if we talked about those two guys, but I guess I think they asked us, but, but they were there and saw the whole tournament, so I, they must have seen them because they played really well. And uh, of course, Anders, a really great skater, so he was probably right about that. Well, um, and I, I squid, I'm going to get you in here in a minute, but I mean, first off, now, now Boria, uh, you and Inger are flying to Canada for your first training camp. What was going through your mind coming across the ocean and flying into Toronto? Any idea what you were going to face? Well, uh, you know, what, what was good was because we visited Toronto, you know, before, like a, a couple of months before, which was really good because then we saw the gardens, we saw everything around a little bit, you know, so, so that was really nice. So, and uh, they, you know, Jim Gregory and, and uh, I met Harold too, uh, and Jerry, they were so nice. So we, we really feel, felt comfortable to, to go over. But of course, we, uh, I didn't speak good English, but I, that was the only regret when I was sitting on the plane over there. Because I, I said to myself in the school, I said, uh, when I was uh, reading English, I said, what do I need that for? But when, when I was sitting on the plane <laughs> over, I said, holy shit, why didn't I quit? <laughs> <Learn English. laughs> well, now, let's quit this. You can kind of recount to this one because. I mean, the Maple Leafs, I mean, you, when you got traded to Toronto and you yeah. and Billy flew across the country, yeah. what, I mean, you knew of the Maple Leafs a little more than Borea would have. What was your thought when you landed in Toronto for the first time? I mean, I think you guys, I mean, what did you guys do on your way over? You guys probably know, and you two probably had a beer in the way over. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny because, yeah, Billy, we got on the plane and Billy said, let's have a few beer. And uh, it happened to be election day in Canada, so they weren't serving alcohol on the airplane. And I think Billy, I think he got up to, I think he offered the flight attendant a thousand bucks to serve us. So they said, Billy, don't waste your money. I said, we, we don't need a beer, like, you know. And 
So then we land and there's like 40 people waiting there, cameras, writers and everything. And I said, boy, is it, am I ever happy that we didn't drink or we didn't, didn't have any beer because that would have been terrible to come off the plane and have 40 reporters because I think our meeting with Punch after that would have been a lot different because uh, <laughs> when we met with him, he said, all he said was, you guys are going to get a great opportunity to play here in Toronto and uh, just keep your nose clean and do what you do best. Now, if we had to get off the plane after six or seven beer, that meeting might have been a little bit <laughs> different. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but you know what? It was At the same time, it was great because right away we went to Long Island. They were on the road and we, we started there, came back. And, you know, the guys were great. You know, the Boria and Ronnie Ellis and uh, Turnbull and Daryl. Well, Daryl, I don't know if he was really happy about it because I got traded for one of his buddies, Tiger. And, of course, Lanny had been shipped out and all his buddies. And that was Punch's way of getting back at Daryl. And But, you know, at the end of the day, we all got along. And, uh, you know, it was Coming to Toronto and putting on that Maple Leaf sweater for me was like, you know, unbelievable. Playing in the gardens, knowing that, you know, my parents could be watching on TV and everything. It was, it was great. Now, Boria, for you, when you walked into that dressing room for the first time for yeah. training camp, how did the players treat you? I mean, this was 1973. Yeah. Tommy Bergman had played in the league before you. Uh, there was a other Swede by the name of Elf Stenner who played a couple of games in the 60s, and there was a Czechoslovakian player that played a couple of games also. But you were really the first sort of big name that coming from Europe to step in. Mm -hmm. What was your thought walking through the door, and how did the players respond? Well, it, it was really good. You know, we, we uh, actually, the week, uh, the first week, we were not in the dressing room, the regular dressing room. We were in the dressing room, crossed the door. And that I guess the older rookies was there, and that actually the new players were there. I think there was some uh, I don't because Eddie Shack came back to Toronto that, at the same year too, <laughs> and so uh, so we were there. So after week after week after the first week, then we got in. Then we got in the dressing room. So uh, so, uh, but it, but that was so fantastic to see just the gardens and. Uh, I, what I remember the first time we skated in the, at the gardens, that was uh, when we were, we came four or five days before the training camp. And uh, we, uh, me and the they asked us, you know, do you want to skate? Uh, you want to go and skate? Yeah, okay, we can go skate. So we, uh, me and Inge went out, uh, out on the ice and then we saw everybody was sitting up in the stands, you know, all the, you know, uh, uh, Harold and everybody, I guess, you know, the whole day one, I guess they were anxious to see us too, see uh, if we could skate, uh, you know, at all. So uh, me and Inge, we told, we said to each other, we said, listen, because we have been skating with Brunus, you know, for for two months. So we really, we were really prepared for the, for the training camp. But we said, let's really show them now. So we skated like crazy, like crazy, we're shooting the puck and everything. So uh, really tried to show them like, no, we can play hockey. So, and I, you know, Jerry told me afterwards, you know, like many years afterwards, he said, listen, that time, because he was so nervous because everybody else, nobody else had seen us play. So why yes. Bob Davidson, but, but then everybody sort of looked up to Jerry. Oh my God, they are good. <laughs> <laughs> and we looked at, okay, yeah, well, what did I say? <laughs> uh, so I guess that, that was fun sort of afterwards. So you did feel, I mean, did you feel any, so you did feel some pressure, obviously, going into that camp. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was, there was a lot of pressure because coming from another country and come in and play. And, you know, we, we knew a little bit uh, because we knew there was like a lot of fighting because, it, we, you know, in Sweden, you can't fight and all that stuff. So, but when we were, uh, we, you know, got in the dressing room. The guys in the, they really took care of us really good. You know, they could see, uh, you know, I think they could see that we could play hockey and we maybe could help them. So at, at that, they were really nice to us. But of course, in training camp, there was, there was a lot of, uh, that was, it was tough because a lot of guys wanted to kick us out of there too. 
So who, uh, I, okay, so who was the first guy? To, uh, that's what I was going to ask you next. During the scrimmages, you obviously must have been tested a few times. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who, who was the first guy to take a shot at you? Oh, I can't remember. I think there was a lot of them. <laughs> 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 I think a few of them wanted to, to show those sh chicken sweets, you know, let's, let's see, let's go home. Uh, because, you know, we really, if you look at it, because we're coming over and trying to take their job. So yeah. it was a little bit like that. So Yeah. I, you know, now Rick, I mean, you can relate to that. What was your first practice like with the Leafs when you stepped on the ice and you're traded for a couple of very popular players? Yeah. You guys, you and Billy feel a little bit of, now that you realize what you're walking into after being greeted at the airport, did that sort of twist you guys a little differently? Well, no, not, not me anyway. I don't know about Billy, but for me, I was happy because I wasn't getting the opportunity in Vancouver. And I knew that I was going to get that opportunity in Toronto. And so I was excited more than anything. I wasn't nervous. I was excited. And uh, I remember the first game we were in Long Island and, uh, and I scored two goals that night. And then I thought after that, it was like, okay, everything's going to be fine. I'm going to get a chance to play. They said I would, you know, I did. I scored two goals in my first game. So I, I felt quite comfortable and, and the guys made it very comfortable for us too. And that, that was the most important thing. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, and, and Boria could probably speak to this too, is that, you know, you look at today, you look at back then and, you know, when the captain or whoever says, let's go for, we're going for lunch, you better show up. And, uh, Boria would be there. And today it's, it's a lot different. Like, you know, guys don't show up for lunches or team gatherings and, and that sort of thing. But back then it was a lot different. So everybody was there. And I think that would, probably was the best thing for me because you got to talk to everybody and you got to sit down and have a beer and talk to everybody. And uh, I think that kind of, brought us together and made you feel like, okay, I'm part of this. Well, you know, that's part of it too, Boris. So there, I was going to go with that in a little bit, but we'll get right into that now. I mean, part of the team rituals are the fabric of team bonding, and it's very prevalent in all sports. And hockey, for you, that part of it, the socializing, like in Sweden, did your team go out, your teams would go out after him and they'd go and have a beer or they'd socialize. But in hockey, it was a very predominant thing for players to go out together to have a beer. How did you find all that when you first arrived? Did that surprise you or were you expecting that? No, not really. I mean, in, in Sweden too, like, you know, of course, everybody, they were not professional back home. Everybody has a job and work in daytime and all that stuff. So you can't go and have a, have a beer because you have the practice then you go back to work for some of the guys. But, but in Canada, that was really good, you know, like it's good to say, you know, that's, that's really important to, 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 to join the guys. And, you know, of course, you see each other in the dressing room and everything, but that's really important you know, off, off the ice and, you know, sit and you know, have a chat and, and, and discuss the different things. And that, then you really get so much closer to each other. And that's how you build a team, I think. And not just drinking beer, but I mean, I have a beer. Then everybody sort of relax and, you know, maybe want to say something and everything. Like, you know, everybody's listening to that, everybody, too. So, that yeah, was I mean, like today. So Boria, the sorry, Rick. Sorry, Boria, going back to that, and uh, that brings a, a certain amount of trust, too, between the players when you get to know one another. And I remember during our time there, if you, you, you probably remember when Harold canceled the charters for the whole second half of the season. Yeah. And we would, so now we were staying overnight after every game and we yeah. had Miroslav Fritscher and Hedicek and there was a lot of new guys in the fold. And we would go out after games on the road and get to know these guys, which we didn't know them that well. And I thought that that was probably the best thing that ever happened to us. We were the fifth best team in the league in the second half because all of a sudden, you know, I got to know Peter and, and Miro and some of the guys that we didn't really get to know. And then all of a sudden, there was a lot of trust there in one another. And I thought that was really, really important. Much the same as you guys probably had in the 70s, I would think. No, that's true. Because they, 
that's what's so important to, to uh, again, I told Inga too, because Inga didn't drink uh, at all because his, uh, his dad had some problems. So he said, I'm not drinking, but I told him, listen, Inga, you gotta follow, come with us, try take one beer. I know you don't, you don't like it, but have a beer just to chat with the guys and everything, because it's really important to know everybody off the ice too. And I think that's, that's really good what, what we, we did there. And same when you and Billy came, I mean, I know how hard it is to, I never got traded to, to a team, but I know how hard it got to be to come to another team from another team, you know, so then you got to really even more make them, you know, home because you know they're coming to us and they're going to help us. So that's really important. Well, and again, you, if you guys look at today, the kids today go to the rink, they eat at the rink now, then they go home and play yeah. video games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> A little different. <laughs> it's a little different. So, I mean, you know, them hearing these type of stories, they just probably can't. And the other part of it is, uh, you and Inga would be the only two foreign players on the club. Yeah. And you're looking around the room at 18, 20 other guys. I mean, now today, there could be eight Swedes, five Americans, four Czechs, and five yeah. Canadians. Yeah, you know? it is a little different. Yeah, it is different. I mean, but, I mean, but uh, you know, when when we made a team, like when we came in, Brussels, they were they were so nice. They were they were so nice, everybody to us. And because I think they saw that we could play hockey and we could we can help this team. And when they knew that, everybody was so nice, really. You remember your so that brings me. Oh. Hold on, that bring, brings me back to when I came in, and of course, we got treated very well. Boria treated yeah. us extremely well, and I remember Boria having a few parties at his house uh, to get the guys all together and so on. And uh, I remember the one time you had a beautiful place in Hyde Park. And I remember going into the kitchen and looking for a beer or something. And I opened a fridge and it was just all bottles of vodka, the whole fridge, <laughs> you had two fridges. <laughs> and I, I went, Oh, okay. This is, this, this is different, but, but you know what, that, that, Boria had those get-togethers to make us feel like we were all a team. And I, I really, really enjoyed that. I thought it was really good that he did that. And, uh, but you know what, I, it just made us all feel more comfortable, you know, that, that guys that were older than us were looking out for us and making sure that we felt comfortable. And uh, that was one of the, the the highlights of, of us coming to Toronto was, and I know Joyce, uh, my wife, we went there to Boreas a few times and we got treated like, uh, like we were family. Mm -hmm. Well, I know any of the guys I talked to from that era said that Toronto Maple Leaf teams from the eighties, they weren't that good, but those guys sure had a good time. So you can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a good time on, on, on the ice and off the ice. <laughs> Well, boy, here, let's go back to your, do you remember your first game was against Buffalo? And, yeah. and you were a player of the game. So did that, did you sort of take a sigh of relief and think, I've showed them that I can play? Well, I, I knew I could play. I mean, we played some exhibition games, so we, that was not the first game I played. So I knew what was going on. But uh, of course, it was a little, you know, nerves, you know, to go in in the first game there. But it was just, you know, I never had problems really with that. You know, all I did, you know, want to go out and play hockey and I love the game. So that was, I, I just played my game and played hard. So that's all I thought of. Okay, well, how about this one? Your second game was in Philadelphia. Now, how about going yeah. to the, what did you know about the Spectrum at the time and playing the Flyers? Nothing. How does that <laughs> surprise going in there? Well, it's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know. Really, I, I didn't know nothing about that. And, and that was a funny story I have because in this, I think it was in the first or second uh, period, I, was, I had a fight with uh, Dave Schultz. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, he's, he slashed me in, in, in the corner and I slashed him back because, you know, all the guys said, you know, don't just get hammer back, you know, whatever you do, you know, and if you drop the gloves, you know, you know, no, just give them back. Okay, so I said, fuck it. You know, I, I gave him a, a slash to back. And all of a sudden, we came up the blue line. He slashed me, I slashed him back. And then we dropped the gloves. And we had a fight. And, uh, I mean, of course, in actually, in, in, the, in the training camp, we did uh, 
some practice after practice the guys teach us how we're supposed to hold on to the guys and little tricks and all that stuff which was good but i i i, I said sort of uh when i tell the story i always said you know i was holding on for my life you know because but but the, mike pellick actually told a little story too he said Dave Schultz tried to hit me, but he couldn't get in a, not one shot. And I remember that he didn't get a shot at me, and and uh, and he was frustrated, I guess Mike said. But anyway, so I, the the fight was good. I don't, I don't know if I got in any hits, and I can't remember that. But uh, the fight was okay. But it was the, the the fun thing that was, I, I came in the dressing room after the first period, and we're sitting, and I can't remember who sat beside me, and he said, "Well." Well, everybody said, what a good warrior, good fight and everything. Oh, thanks. Uh, and then he said, do you know that guy? Do you know who you, you were fighting? <laughs> no. <laughs> and he said, well, that was the toughest guy in National Hockey League. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> no. so, maybe, so, so maybe Boria was a good thing that you didn't know a lot about what was going on, the flyers and the you know, broad street bullies and who the yeah. tough guys were because that kind of, if you hadn't known all that and everybody had explained everything like that to you, you might have maybe gone looking at it a little bit differently, whereas the being naive to the situation, so to speak, not knowing probably helped you. Oh, yeah. No, I agree with you. You know, that was better to don't, not, not know anything about them. Yeah. That was, I agree hundred percent. Well, now Whereas in my, in my case, it was a lot different because I knew all about it. Yeah. And I, I felt that I had to fight in order to give myself some room and, and let people know that, okay, you're not going to intimidate me. But the problem was I got the hell beat out of me a, a shitload of times because I had to fight some of the tough guys. And uh, I remember playing against Boston and everybody talking about, you know, Stan Jonathan and Winsink and all these guys. But I remember going into the boards with Stan Jonathan. We came off the boards. I don't know what happened, but our gloves came off. And I grabbed him and I hit him square in the nose with the three hardest punches I could ever throw. And I looked at him and he went, Rrr. and I went, oh boy. So I just grabbed on and he came out with an uppercut, kind of dazed me a bit, threw me down. And he said, don't ever do that again, kid. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the good thing is he knew that I was going to show up. Yeah. And, and I think everybody on that team at that point knew that, okay, we can't intimidate this guy because he's going to show up. And I, I thought that was one of the big things that I had to do in the beginning of my career. Because I knew all of them. Whereas you didn't, it probably was a good thing.